start and introduce myself. So I'm Jen Mixes Olds. I am the chair of this committee, uh, the Committee on Ocean Acoustics Education and Expertise. And today you are all part of the Higher Education and Training Programs Information Gathering Panel. This is the third panel in a series of five. Um, and this is specifically looking at higher education and training programs in ocean acoustics, acoustics and supporting disciplines. I always wanna make sure that we um, highlight the supporting disciplines because um, that is an integral part of any um, acoustics education. Um, so I am gonna turn this over to Caroline for some um, logistics and then I'll jump back in and introduce the committee. Thank you, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Caroline Bell. I'm the study director from the National Academies for this um, project, working closely with Jen and the, the rest of our committee. Um, just a quick uh, virtual meeting logistics slide. Um, we ask that everybody please mute yourself unless you are speaking. Um, use the, when we get to the question and answer portion, please use the raise hand or chat feature. Um, we will be taking questions from the committee first, but if there is time um, at the end of our committee asking questions, we will take questions from the public. Um, and also if um, public audience has questions that they would like to put in the chat, um, National Academy staff can work to follow up um, with you on your questions uh, after the meeting as well if, as if we do not get to them. Uh, and then um, we would like you, especially if you're asking a question to turn your camera on um, when you're speaking to support a sense of community um, in our virtual meeting environment. And then finally, um, to let everyone know the meeting is being recorded. Uh, we will be uh, posting the meeting to our project website uh, following the, probably next week, it'll be up on the, the project webpage and also sharing with one of our committee members who could not join today. So with that, I will turn this back to Jen. Awesome, thank you. So I do wanna thank all of our, um, our speakers and the public that has joined because the goal for today's meeting is to collect information and perspectives to inform the committee's report. And so this is, as I said, the third out of five uh, information gathering panels that we're having. Specifically, um, we have professionals here in the acoustics and ocean acoustics workforce to talk about um, higher education and training programs. One thing that I can share with you already that I've learned through um, this committee and its um, previous information gathering panels is that um, higher education and formal education is something that we, we do really well in some aspects. But these training programs for more marine techs related to calibration methods and technologies are some things that our nation doesn't do as well. And so I'm very interested to learn more, not only about formal education opportunities, but about training programs and opportunities um, outside of a, a traditional higher education um, establishment. And we'll be really focusing on some of the successes and challenges in higher education and training programs. Go to the next slide. I'd like to introduce the committee. Again, I'm Jen Mixes Olds. I'm the chair. I am from the University of New Hampshire, where I'm the center director uh, for the Center for Acoustics Research and Education. I'm just gonna read off the rest of the names so we can give um, ample time to allow our panelists to introduce themselves. Joining me on this committee is Andrea Anguelas from Penn State University. We've got Art Bagger from MIT, Lisa Hodling from um, Idos Education, Rujan Lee from the University of Washington, Carolyn Ruckel from the US Geological Survey, Gail Schilcroft from the University of Rhode Island, and Preston Wilson from the University of Texas, Austin. And so here is the statement of task for the committee um, as part of the National Academy's process in forming the committee, the statement of task was formed in conjunction with the National Academies and the, the sponsors of the, of the committee. And I'm not gonna read this word by word, but you can see that there are really four different um, tasks and areas that we're focusing on, education, workforce demand, competencies required to meet that demand, and then strategies to raise the profile of careers in ocean acoustics. I think today's panel with um, the speakers and panelists that have been selected 
We're really going to be have a deep dive into number one, the examination of ocean acoustics education and identification of competencies required for different levels of education and training programs. Um, number four is an outreach. We have a new uh, a future information gathering panel on number four. And one of our first information gathering panels was really focused on number two, understanding the demand for acoustics expertise um, in the workforce, both today and anticipated over the next 10 years. Um, so that's how this information gathering panel fits into the other five. Go to the next slide. Um, here's a list of what the report will include. Um, we are doing um, a detailed analysis, both through the information gathering panels and through the survey that has been sent out on academic institutions that offer courses in ocean acoustics, um, public and private sector professional level organizations, and I'm going to say professional societies um, that require or even offer educational opportunities in ocean acoustics as part of their operations. Um, workforce, is it going to be a key chapter? Training programs, again, highlighting this outside of the traditional higher education um, opportunities. And then um, looking at current acoustic programs. And our job really is to make recommendations on what the next 10 years might look like. And so that's where everybody's words today will be captured and considered for inclusion as part of this report. Um, part of the process in the National Academies is once the committee puts together the report, it will be reviewed by external reviewers, um, and that feedback will be taken into account um, before the, the final draft or the final product is, is produced. And last slide, before we, here's our agenda. So this is the Higher Education Training Programs Panel. Um, I'm going to allow each of the four people to introduce themselves in just a minute. Um, after the introductions, each person will have about uh, one to three slides, and then we'll go into a question and answer period that's going to be started by the committee members and the public. Please, if you do have questions, use that um, chat feature, or question and answer feature within the Zoom program to, to get your questions in there, too. So um, we're going to start with John Buck. I'd like to introduce Dr. John Buck. He's at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Um, he, he's worked there for as long as I'm in my career because he was my, one of my first master's advisors. So it's great to have him in, in uh, speaking about higher ed at, at, on this committee panel. So John, I'm gonna let you introduce you yourself, your university and your programs. All right, well, thank you very much, Jen. And thank you to all the committee for inviting me to speak today. Uh, again, my name is John Buck. I'm the chancellor professor of electrical and computer engineering. Uh, at uh, the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. Uh, for those not familiar with our campus, uh, UMass Dartmouth is a public doctoral research university on the southern coast of Massachusetts. I sort of included a map to help you orient us. We are uh, between the Naval Undersea Warfare Center over in Newport, Rhode Island, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution over on Cape Cod, uh, closely connected with the cities of Fall River and New Bedford in Massachusetts. Uh, UMass Dartmouth is the smallest of the five UMass campuses, uh, but we've always had a disproportionate impact in marine science in general and ocean acoustics. Uh, and specifically, the first PhD program on our campus uh, was in electrical engineering, and it was followed shortly afterwards by a PhD in marine science. Uh, we are usually one of the top two universities supplying engineering talent to the Navy Newick uh, Research Facility in Newport, uh, neck and neck with the uh, University of Rhode Island. Uh, competing for that top spot in many years. Um, and also importantly, we're rated in one of the top two universities in Massachusetts for social mobility by US News and World Report. Roughly half of our undergraduates are first generation uh, students going to college in their family. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the ocean acoustics activity and related activity in our campus is highly concentrated in the electrical and computer engineering department. For a relatively small campus and department, I'm lucky to have this critical mass of three of us who are all actively researching and, and actively funded by the Navy in ocean acoustics research. Uh, Professor David Brown is an expert in acoustics transducers, already a field identified as a critical national need about five years ago. Um, 
My expertise is in array signal processing and animal bioacoustics. Uh, Professor Paul Gendron is an expert in underwater acoustic communications. Uh, and both Dr. Brown and Dr. Gendron bring expertise to our, our students in our campus from their previous employment at DOD labs before coming here. Uh, this means we're able to offer a, a, a really strong uh, foundation to our students in classes like the acoustic and electromagnetics waves is required of all masters and PhD students in our program. Uh, and if truth be told, since we're on the record here, that's about 80% acoustics when David Brown teaches it out of the Fundamentals of Acoustics book by uh, Kinsler, Fry, Coppins, and Sanders. Uh, and so there's a, a strong list of courses there. Uh, you know, our, our graduate enrollments are, are listed here along with our graduates. That's the total enrollment. The, the ocean acoustics related graduates are probably between a half and a third of that in any given year. Uh, and the committee had asked us to reflect on the sort of 10 year horizon for our program. Uh, and, and to do that, I wanted to put in perspective that uh, last year, with, we were very fortunate to have the support of our, our Dean of Engineering uh, and also our Provost and Vice Chancellor for Research to have a tenure track position open uh, where one of the preferred hiring areas was in marine related electrical engineering and ocean acoustics. Uh, I chaired that search. Uh, David Brown served as one of the members. And we worked very actively to get the word out about that relatively rare tenure track position. Uh, but in the end, it was very frustrating. We didn't have any candidates who were qualified enough for that position to make the cut for campus interviews. Uh, so that we, we did hire, to be clear, an excellent faculty member. I'm looking forward to her joining us in the fall. Uh, but her specialty is in optics and optical signal processing. Uh, and this, so this was really a a contrast from uh, the last two times I chaired searches 10 and 15 years ago, we had multiple finalists who were strong candidates in ocean acoustics. Uh, and, and why that's important is, is uh, of the three faculty members you're looking at there, I am the youngest of them. I'm 55 years old, which means there's just an academic time scale. So there's just barely enough time for us to mentor the next generation of faculty through the six year tenure cycle and get them established as mid-career researchers before some of us are retiring and winding down. Uh, so it really is a critical window in the next few years for us if ocean acoustics is going to persist having the large impact in our campus it has had. Um, you know, we teach a good range of courses, but you know, not nearly as many as I had as a graduate student in the early 90s uh, in ocean acoustics at MIT and Woods Hole. Uh, and so I think, I mean, the, the rest of the slide, I think, speaks for itself. So I'll stop here and wait for your questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we're going to move on to Dr. James Miller. Uh, Jim is at the University of Rhode Island, where he's a professor and current department chair. Jim? Thanks, Jen. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, you can. Great. Great. Uh, thanks again to the committee for uh, inviting uh, me and, and to let uh, your committee and uh, the interested public in uh, the University of Rhode Island. Uh, I just wanted to start, we, we're in the midst of a, a experimental campaign now that is involving ocean acoustic experiment off of the New England Seamounts. And um, we have students in various cruises and everything. I just wanted to show you the the uh, some of the students who are, are are out there either right now or just got back on the RV Armstrong and Endeavor. So that's very exciting. Next slide, please. So uh, ocean acoustics has been a key component uh, in the ocean engineering graduate program in, in our in our program here at URI uh, ocean acoustics is predominantly in ocean engineering. Uh, which is one of 13 programs in the world accredited in, in ocean engineering. Uh, we're the oldest ocean engineering program in the United States. Uh, with the graduate program, it's ocean acoustics has always been part of it. Um, and in 1995, we began producing BS graduates. And uh, Laura Van Uflin, who is you see on the right, is one of our, I think she spoke to your committee recently, she uh, teaches the uh, undergraduate course in ocean acoustics, and she's extremely popular and, and very effective. Also on the right is uh, our research professor, uh, Professor Gopu Pati. Uh, the slide there that you see in the middle, the, the numbers there is uh, ocean engineering student head count in all degrees in all areas. Uh, so um, we're steady at about 180, 185 students. Uh, we are 10 tenure track faculty um, 
actually 11 as of yesterday. We just uh, uh, closed on a deal. Uh, two research faculty and six joint faculty members. We have strong joint faculty members with the Graduate School of Oceanography and Civil Engineering. In the, in the field of ocean acoustics, we've, in the last three years, we've graduated 25 uh, students who specialized in ocean acoustics through their capstone, 15 master's degrees, two PhDs. Uh, and uh, like I said, uh, we have three tenure track faculty members who do, uh, and we're mostly a uh, go to see uh, experimentally oriented department. Next slide, please. Our curriculum is, uh, like I said, uh, Professor Van Ufflin teaches our introduction to underwater acoustics. Um, uh, Dr. Steve Crocker actually is one of our uh, adjunct faculty members. He teaches a very popular sonar systems engineering. He was at Newick for many years uh, and now is, is at Michael. Um, and our undergraduate, we, we always offer a capstone uh, in specializing in underwater acoustics. Uh, this year we have eight undergraduates out of the 30 or so in the senior class. And then we teach a, a number of different uh, acoustic, uh, co courses in acoustics, um, including transducers, marine bioacoustics, underwater acoustics too, which is really a beam forming class and uh, ocean acoustic propagation. I think that's, uh, what's the next slide? I think I just answered the questions. Uh, oh yes, um, this is very exciting. We are, our facilities here on the Bay Campus of the University of Rhode Island on Narragansett Bay are, are old, uh, mainly built in the 70s. Um, in, uh, in November, last November, the, uh, the Rhode Island voters approved a $100 million bond to do Bay Campus improvements. And some of that, part of that is going to Ocean Engineering Complex which will go to build a new tank building with a 100 meter um, long wave and tow tank, uh, and also a new acoustic tank, 30 feet by uh, cubed. Um, that uh, renovation is actually, uh, you might be able to hear the backup signals that we're, they're starting to build some of that uh, already, but we expect this building to be completed in 26, 27. And I think that's uh, going to complete. I have a slide with the answers to your questions, but I'll I'll stop here. Thank you, Jim. Okay, our next panelist is Dr. Dan Brown, who's an assistant research professor at Penn State. Turn it over to you, Dan. Hey, Jim. Introduction. Well, I appreciate it, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to to speak here. Um, I, I think the two panelists that have gone before me have done a really nice job, kind of outlining the pipeline that we need to have for for graduate level education and undergraduate level education I, I wanted to try and pay a little bit more attention to the training piece that you had mentioned kind of in in setting this up um you know I, as i look at it we have kind of a a lack of expertise within ocean acoustics um, researchers and practitioners that are across our universities our laboratories and industry and i, and I think one of your earlier panels probably would have touched on on that lack of a workforce. And so we, we, we need to both address the pipeline of new students that are coming in that can be early career hires, but also address the on the job training or the training that can go on for people that are working within these industries. And I think to be honest, I'm a personally a really good example of this. I, I've been working in these ocean acoustics related fields for 15 years. But my actual degree that I had coming into these fields was a master's degree in physics where I studied thermoacoustics. And I went to work at a Navy lab. They set me down at a desk and I spent a year of on the job training, trying to self teach and work with the people there to come up in my skill level to be able to, to be able to work. I eventually was able to move to Penn State that had a resident program where I could pursue a PhD. But, but that's a pretty unique situation where someone can be in residence as a graduate student while working full time. And, and I think that the thing we need to start thinking about is trying to addressing these expertise gaps through training that can be made available for people that are currently practitioners, current engineers, current scientists within the ocean acoustics community. And, and in trying to think about different models that, that could fit that, I, I think of of three different levels that that we can try and meet those needs at. 
And I'm going to highlight specific examples of, of each of these. I'm calling out a, a specific institution in each case. I, I'm sure there's a broader range. So, so if I'm omitting someone, uh, I, if I'm omitting someone, I apologize. One starting kind of at the at the easiest, most accessible level was something that I know I took part in as a um, as as a new person in ocean acoustics was leveraging things like tutorials that are specifically offer, offered at the OCEANS, the IEEE OCEANS conferences. Right? This gives us an opportunity and gives someone new to a field an opportunity to get a highly focused um, set of lectures directed at a specific topic, kind of a, a small nugget of um, information that can be delivered without requiring an enormous amount of investment in their time. You're, you're already at these conferences, and, and so you might as well be able to leverage these. The next level up that I think are, are more intensive in residence short courses. And the example that I would call out for this would be the University of New Hampshire MASS program. It's actually running next week, and I'll, I'll be one of the lecturers at that. Um, Jen, I believe you will be, you'll be there as well. Th this is a really nice example of, of a kind of education that can be provided as an intensive onboarding session for people that are already working within the field of ocean acoustics. You come for an in-residence, highly focused one week um, set of lectures, seven hours a day of lecture across a broad range of topics. And, and for someone that is just beginning in the field that maybe doesn't have the, uh, the lexicon or the vocabulary or an understanding of kind of the breadth of topics, that's the kind of thing that can help to up level a person and help them make a make a leap forward in their in their understanding of ocean acoustics. But, but as I look at that example, you know, it, it kind of points to the need for something potentially deeper than that. And, and a corollary that I think of is the is the radar lectures that are offered by a group like Georgia Tech. So the Georgia Tech Research Institute offers a pretty expansive set of highly focused short courses that can be in residence short courses across, if you go look at their website, across 34 different areas. And this is a gap that I think we have today in being able to train our people that are working in these fields. There isn't this availability, availability for a more deeper focus set of courses um, on, on specific topics of interest. And finally, I think the last model that one would think of would be full degree granting programs that have been adapted for the working professional. Um, so, so an example of this would be the Naval Postgraduate School. They offer the ability to have to have degrees um, as a working professional, either as a member of the Navy or a, or a uh, civilian working for the Department of the Navy. And, and so that's somewhat restricted to those groups of people. The other example would be the institution that, that I'm based at, which is which is Penn State University. At Penn State in the graduate program of acoustics, we have a fully distance, um, a fully adapted distance education program where students can receive a master of engineering without having a in residence portion here. And when I teach courses in the in the fall of every year, roughly 50% of the students participating in my course are working through this distance ed working through this distance education. Program so so we're almost 50 50 split across the majority of our classes and they're offered in this kind of hybrid fashion where the distance student is receiving the same lectures that the in residence students are. The, the advantage of this is those distance students can sign up for just a single class at a time. The lectures are presented live and they're recorded. They can consume the material on a time scale that works for them. So, so in this sense, I, I think as we think about training these working people, these people within the ocean acoustics community that want to improve their knowledge or improve, um, improve the, um, expand the topics that they know about, we need to think about different tiers of different tiers of intensity, different tiers of commitment, and then how to make those things more widely available so that we can meet people where they're available and where they have time. Thank you, Dan. Um, next, we're going to go to Keita Jones from the Acoustical Society of America, where she serves as the Education and Outreach Coordinator. Keita? Hi, yeah, thanks again uh, for having me. Uh, so I'm a little bit different than the previous panelists um, in that I kind of straddle education and outreach, as you might have guessed. So um, 
First, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about what I do as the Education and Outreach Coordinator for ASA. So just generally speaking, I promote and assist with all education efforts across the society. Um, so I've listed a couple of the committees here, like Education and Acoustics, Women in Acoustics, Student Council, the Committee to Improve Racial Diversity and Inclusivity, and all 14 technical committees and a bunch of other administrative committees in there. And so um, I just wanted to highlight that, and I've kind of bolded here some of the technical areas that I think are the most relevant to this group. Um, but I actually have a background in linguistics, so I kind of fall in the uh, PNP and speech communication side. So my expertise is not in uh, ocean acoustics or maybe kind of the, the main related fields, but I do work a lot with how we can um, reach students who are interested in acoustics, who want to pursue acoustics, how we support those students um, more generally speaking. So next slide, please. So um, I wanted to list here, this is a long list and we, I'm not gonna touch on all of these things in this um, just brief overview, but if anyone has questions, do please feel, uh, please feel free to reach out. But um, these are the ways that ASA tries to encourage and support students that are pursuing acoustics. And on the left, you see um, the programs that I'm primarily uh, working with as support staff are the kind of generalized acoustics initiative. So these are for students who are interested in acoustics in a more broad sense. They might not know what area of acoustics they want to pursue, um, and they might not really know what acoustics is to begin with. And so we have a lot of programs that are designed to be the gateway into acoustics. Um, on the left-hand side of, the, uh, of this slide, you'll see acoustical oceanography um, or related fields that are more specific to um, the interests that this committee is um, discussing. So one of these things are, you know, ASA will co-sponsor uh, specific topics, um, whether that's a workshop or a conference or a meeting, a tutorial, uh, these can be co-sponsored by ASA, considering that a big, often a barrier to education is funding. Um, so that's financial support is really important. We also have, uh, occasionally webinars or uh, tutorials or workshops that are focused on acoustics, uh, acoustic ocean, excuse me, uh, acoustical oceanography topics and related topics. And of course, there are the special sessions that are organized by the TCs, and those often include special workshops or tutorials um, that happen at ASA meetings. Um, next slide. So I thought I would answer one of the questions that was posed to us by the committee members um, that I see from my perspective. Um, so some of the challenges that are that we face in just promoting acoustics education to begin with is that, as you may have noticed from some of the previous panelists, acoustics is what I call a discovery field. That means that unless students... Um, are, it's very rare for students to intentionally pursue acoustics at the undergraduate level. So that means they attend whichever college they'd like to attend, and then they maybe discover, a discover acoustics as juniors or seniors, or maybe they don't really figure it out until graduate school, or in some cases, as you, as you just heard, until they're in a career. So that's a really big challenge that we're meeting when it comes to how do you make sure that a student who's at an institution that doesn't offer ocean acoustics finds ocean acoustics? Um, the other thing is really a big one, and I think that this is part, partially what this committee is addressing, is that developing, maintaining, and improving the acoustics education landscape is time and labor intensive. Um, I am a full-time staff at ASA, so I am paid to think about and work on education efforts from within ASA. However, many people working in this area are doing it purely as volunteer work in addition to a full-time job. And so we need to think about how we're allocating resources to actually improve the education landscape. Um, I know that was maybe a lot in a short amount of time, but of course I'm happy to speak about any specific ASA uh, programs. Thanks. Thank you, Kia. that was excellent. You jumped in and started with our challenges already, and those were very insightful comments. Thank you. 
Um, our final panelist is David Hunter from the US Naval Reserve Meteorology and Oceanography Sea School. So David, I will turn it over to you for your introduction. Okay, well, thank you. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, let me make sure I am, is my slide being shared? It's not yet. Hold on just okay, Hold on just a second. Oh, I, I didn't. Here we go. There we come. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So um, uh, my name is David Hunter. I am with uh, it, what's uh, called NR Sinmok Navo, and I'm, I feel like I'm different than everybody. Um, I am probably on the other side of the spectrum from all of this. Um, I'm a Navy reservist, uh, been in for 23 years. Um, typically right now I work out of the Naval Oceanographic Office. My formal academic training, training similar to Kena Jones is not acoustics, it's uh, chemistry, material science and toxicology. So I'm uh, a kind of a weird duck on all of these things. Um, So uh, I'm just going to give a little background uh, for those who don't know uh, about the Naval Oceanographic Office. Uh, we're located at the Space Center in Mississippi. Uh, we are one of the, uh, I, I would say, one of the scientific arms of the U.S. Navy. Uh, we have about a thousand civilian and military. Uh, that slide might be dated because uh, things in the world have changed. and We've uh, actually divested some people to other parts of the country and world. Um, we are part of a larger group of different divisions, like the ocean. If you uh, see on the side there, you've got the NUC, which is the uh, Operations and Oceanography Command, which kind of handles uh, tactical stuff, Joint Typhoon Warfare Center. Um, FINMOC is a Fleet Numerical Oceanographic Office, which is out of uh, Monterey, California, next to Naval Postgraduate School. Um, NAVO, of course, and we've got our fleet weather centers, both in San Diego and Norfolk. And then uh, NOAC, uh, Yakuska is our anti-submarine warfare branch out of Japan. And then the U.S. Naval Observatory um, in, um, I'm going to be wrong, Washington, D.C. or Virginia. Um, but we, we uh, Naval Oceanographic Office does a survey, a model support, DOD support. Uh, we grab a lot of data and we process it and we use it for different people who need it. Um, you know, this is just very general. I was trying to make the slide to answer questions. Uh, we have lots of different ocean uh, acoustic products that we use. We're more of end user. So we're the people at the front line dropping something in the, in the, you know, in the water. We're uh, putting a, an array behind the ship to, to actually find out data um, during a survey. Um, our people are usually enlisted or officers. Some of us do have formal training in acoustics at the officer level. Um, but like someone said before, I would say the majority of our formal training happens after you get into the field, find out that it exists. And then as part of your training uh, process, you go to probably Monterey at the Naval Graphic School or Scripps or Woods Hole or something like that as a, as a side thing, as a side process. Um, our training at the enlisted level, and I, I bring that up because we, we are the end users. We're the ones who are uh, essentially putting pieces of equipment out in the water. We're bringing data back in. We're post-processing. We're working with the civilians and the officers. And we are typically the ones on a watch floor uh, uh, briefing uh, people. So those, uh, our training is, is a little bit different. Um, so um, training in the Navy starts out, Big Navy is the Naval Oceanographic, I mean, sorry, Naval Aviation Technical Training Division. They handle everything from someone who's gonna shoot a gun to someone who's gonna do IT to weather and oceanography. Um, weather actually for the Navy is part of uh, intelligence now. So I'm, I'm actually uh, also connected with the Naval um, Inf Information Warfare Training Group, and that's where I train out of. Um, I do oceanography for them. But as someone also enlist, uh, also mentioned, the Naval Post Graduate School is an option that we have. Um, there is a certificate in ASW that has a strong um, a hydroacoustic component. And then there are graduate degrees, both um, master's and um, uh, doctoral in ocean acoustics with Naval Postgraduate School. So our enlisted 
level is uh, for what's called uh, the J00 Alpha Naval Enlisted Classification. It's a meteorological and oceanographic forecaster. It's typically required for you to go on orders anywhere to brief anybody. You have to have it. Uh, it usually starts with a A school, which is three months. It's basic observations, meteorology, um, what is a wave, what is a cloud, that sort of thing. Uh, and then there is a follow on C school requirement that's about nine months. And it you can see what that undergoes. As I'm a reservist and reservists have you know, civilian jobs, um, we had to come up with a an alternative for them. That program is over two to three years, has a bunch of online um, uh, prerequisites through uh, MedEd, uh, the Comet program, and uh, some things through Navy, but um, that is an alternative. So the oceanography, oceanography section that I teach is very general. Um, it goes into history of oceanography, you know, geophysical, biological, physical. Um, and you can see that a small component is hydroacoustics and applications related to hydro, um, to acoustic uh, oceanographic models. So I, I bring that up because um, out of a, a nine month course on um, uh, for C school, I, I would say for the nine month course, it might be a week to two weeks on oceanography. And in the reserves, um, we have several prerequisites, but it also is a two week component for oceanography. So, and then of that two week component, you've got just a few days uh, to go over, you know, summary theory and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, some of the training, and I bring this up for the uh, uh, civilians and folks who work, actually work at the Naval Oceanographic Office, someone stated, they put you at a desk and they start you working on the equipment. They start training you on um, uh, acoustics, oceanography. We have a lot of people who come in with degrees in mathematics, electrical engineering, and, and they do have an understanding of, um, you know, signal processing or how a wave moves through the water, but uh, their understanding of it in the, uh, the, the media of the ocean or another, uh, another liquid medium. Um, is not there. Uh, they do have formal academic training where they have people who will essentially be assigned for two years to go get their master's um, and, and be on, on the clock, so to speak. Um, specialized training. Um, and then there are partnerships um, that they have with um, Southern Mississippi University. I believe they still have one with Scripps where they do something. And I, in the past, they had ones with Woodhull. And then obviously, um, Naval Postgraduate School. Um, and this is just what I came up with on challenges. Uh, one is just the awareness uh, that hydroacoustics exists. I mean, I, I found out about it because I was on an ASW watch floor as a guy who didn't know anything. And I always tell the story of something happening in the water and the models didn't map what was actually going on in real life. And a bunch of subject matter experts um, walked out, started drawing equations and formulas and discussing models. And I spent the next two days Googling everything that they talked about because I had no awareness of any of it. Um, but I do bring up also um, the equipment part of it and the buttonology. Um, you know, you, you have these pieces of equipment, someone has to, to click a button. Um, also a lot of the equipment that comes from the, the vendor, um, the interface for that equipment is not always that great. So you have to find someone who's going to create a, an interface that's going to be useful. Um, and then just things about maintenance, keeping things going because, you know, you've got the research side, but if we have a bunch of uh, pieces of equipment out doing things in the world, someone has to take care of that uh, logistics. And the other thing I bring up, which is good or bad, uh, we've got a lot of people who've been doing it for a very long time. And sometimes that that creates legacy effects, and sometimes it creates uh, administrative and, and information silos. We have a lot. Of, I don't want to say too much about this, but you know, uh, uh, Naval Oceanographic Office is a government agency, and sometimes people get kind of caught up in their in their kingdoms, and they they're not great about sharing their data or their information or their knowledge, and um, that becomes a, a an issue. And that's about all that I have. So I'll, I'll just stop sharing.
Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, we have a very diverse panel, which is great. People are coming from formal education places, training programs. Dan highlighted short courses. Kita highlighted a number of different educational opportunities um, through ASA. I think you guys did a good job already addressing one of the, I think, the six questions that we sent out to you early, which was, what types of educational programs are you involved with? I think everybody did a pretty good job sort of describing that. So before I move on with a second question, as we move into the question and answer period, did anyone want to add anything about the, the question types of educational programs you are involved with that you haven't touched on as part of your introduction? Okay, I'm seeing silence there. So we're going to move right on. Um, now I'm going to ask you guys to, to reflect on, on your programs. So what are your programs doing well to recruit and retain students or trainees? Um, and I'm going to add a second onto there is where do you see the low hanging fruit would be for improving um, an area to recruit and retain students? Jim just unmuted. Can I, so. Yeah. Can I? Uh, so the, the, the field uh, of ocean acoustics has been affected by world events. You have a U-shaped um, demographic in terms of, of interest. There is John Buck and Jim Miller with gray hair. And then there's a whole bunch of young people. And, the, and I think the challenge is, is the middle. As, as people like me retire, uh, recruiting, and, and John talked about the, the, the struggles to recruit uh, new people. Is 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 how do we how do we fill that 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 U shaped bowl here? Because you know we had a the Cold War, and then we had you know ASW was out in the desert somewhere, and then and now all of a sudden ASW is everybody's excited about it. So that's why your panel has been formed. One of the reasons. So I, I think it's that middle that we, we've, I can recruit lots of people, but we're, you know, I'm getting old and, 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 you know, five to 50 years from retirement, depending on how long my, my <laughs> last, but uh, so uh, I know that's, I just, I think the, the, the U-shaped bowl here is, 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 is a tough one. I think Kita kind of, alluded to that too, getting students aware earlier. Um, how, how do we do that? How do we do that well? Um, John, you just unmuted. Yeah, that, well, Keita's remarks did, did bring one thing that, that I think falls within one of the other charges of your committee. Um, there's, there's, there's one place where nationally we're, we're not doing a great job that is the open access long before anyone knows what calculus or differential equations are, which is music education. Music is where everybody not or most people, you know, encounter music for the first time or acoustics for the first time, and and I've seen that over the twenty some twenty seven years I've been teaching, you know, the intro classes that you know I when I started I could say show a spectrogram a plot of energy against time and frequency and say this is a mathematical version of a musical score, ask how many people knew how to read music and half my class would raise their hands. These days I'm lucky to get three, you know. And, and the same thing, you know, I'd ask a question about, you know, where, you know, why does, why does a piano and a trumpet playing the same note, the same pitch sound different? And, you know, students have very little idea about that anymore. So I think one of the, the sort of, you know, the, 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 the gateway to acoustics is a, you know, has been a collateral damage in the reduced funding of music education, even in the primary and, and middle schools, as a place where people get excited about acoustics and music. Certainly my own experience was, was why I wanted to go take acoustic selectives was not that I wanted to go eavesdrop on whales and submarines. It was that I wanted to understand, you know, how to build a better amplifier, a better speaker, or how to how to make a, a graphic equalizer work and, and things like that. And so I think you know, maybe something the panel can highlight, you know, is, is that people can discover it at a younger age. And I think we can promote that more. I mean, I think the other thing we can we can do better about this is, is is reaching out. My, my university has recently been aggressively um, participating in programs to connect to some of the community colleges and state colleges around us 
uh, in photonics and optics, which is growing rapidly in Massachusetts for these sort of three plus two master's programs where people start in physics or, or something. And I think there, there are probably ways we could be doing that better, not just at UMass, but at other schools in, in, in you know, building that gateway and making these people aware of them at the these satellite campuses and, and not just at the, you know, the flagship URI campus. And then the last, the last thing I would mention is, is hands-on really works. I think Jim highlighted this and, and Dan to an extent too, of getting, you know, like our senior design groups, one of the, the, the benefits of having that concentration is roughly half of our senior design projects in electrical engineering and mechanical engineering often have some kind of marine science component, even if it's not directly acoustics. And that gets students excited about it. It gets them connected to some of the companies and labs sponsoring those projects um, and, and having those things with hands-on things or um, even, you know, I, I get a lot of mileage out of microphone arrays because as, as you know, Jim can tell you more than I can, it's expensive to hire a boat for a day and put equipment off the side with students, but we can, students can make a lot of educational mistakes with the 30 element microphone array in the field outside the lab um, and, and learn a lot about basics before we, we spend money getting them involved. And it's still hands-on enough, they get excited about it and challenged by it. So I think those are things even for the ocean acoustics community, you know, connecting to air and musical acoustics can, can only yield dividends. Thanks, John. Those were very insightful comments. I, I, I echo the interest in music. So many people that I know of in acoustics started with an interest in music and retained their interest in music, even in a very highly um, technical field. Yeah, um, no, if, I get, if I get up and say, I'm going to talk about the Fourier series, they all go to sleep. If I get up and say, I'm going to explain to you why a piano and a trumpet sound different playing the same note, I have their interest. Very true. Hida has her hand up. Yeah, so one of the things that I was going to mention is that a lot of what I do is exactly what uh, you were just talking about, John, which is how do we actually reframe what acoustics is? Because we know that people are interested in it. And whether you're talking to high school seniors that are going into college or you're talking to college graduates who are about to enter the field, if you use a phrase that they are unfamiliar with, they're not interested in pursuing that, whether it's for their undergraduate career or it's for their first time job out of college. So if you are using terminology that's familiar to ocean acoust acousticians and you're trying to intrigue, say, recent engineers, you need to use language that appeals and is understood by engineers. If you work in an industry that has training on the job and you know you're going to be getting candidates who don't have specific training in ocean acoustics, then I think you should be changing your job calls to reflect that need or want or desire to say, do you have a background in physics? Then you are actually a good candidate for this job, even if you don't know what the word acoustics is, or you're not really familiar with what kind of work is going to be done. And so I think that is actually a gap that can be filled pretty quickly, which is industries who have these open positions and already have a framework for training need to make that ex abundantly clear to job applicants, right? Um, of course, not all industries have that framework to train people on the job. And that is going to put off some potential job, job candidates, right? Like maybe they can slog through on their own by doing their own tutorials and finding the resources on their own, but that's a pretty heavy lift if they could just apply to another job that already matches their um, expectations of what the job will be. Good point. I was also just going to add on that, uh, you know, John had mentioned the uh, musical connection and that, that uh, someone on the watch floor actually explained Fourier um, to me and used music. And I, I, I swear um, angels uh, appeared over his head and I, I wanted to hug him. And this was, you know, 15 <laughs> years ago. And I literally went back to my home after that um, after that training and pulled out linear algebra and read it with a new, entirely new look. Um, but I also wanted to mention on the, the marketing part of it and the education, um, 
some of the connection to just natural systems. Um, one of the things that I do when I try and train people because they just don't get it is I, I try and frame uh, what we do from a um, tactical standpoint um, in Navy is in terms of dolphins and whales, um, you know, active and passive types of sonar uh, systems and, you know, predator prey relationships. And it seems like sometimes they get it if you think about the deep layer where oceans are looking for a mate, long, you know, long distance traveling of a, you know, low frequency signals. But I talk about a whale looking for a girlfriend. They seem to understand that a little bit better than me talking about, <laughs> you know, a signal and dolphins looking for prey using clicks, um, applying it to what we're doing in the, in the sun. So I think there's something where we have to kind of think outside the box and, you know, you know, there's a very formal technical learning part of it, but if we can involve something like connecting it to music or connecting it to nature, it seems like people, um, they, they connect to it a little bit better. I'm gonna go with our, uh, Dan had his hand up first and then I see two hands up in the committee panel on, so the committee members. So I'll go from Dan and then Lisa and Andrea. Go ahead, Dan. Just to uh, just to go. echo the same comment that everyone else is saying, I, I'm actually on the admissions committee for the acoustics program at Penn State, and I would say maybe one in 20 applications don't explicitly mention their love of music as the reason they are applying to a program specifically to study acoustics. It is it is almost a uniformly unifying topic. And if anyone's ever in state college for the fall acoustics party, where the acoustics program has their jam band, I can guarantee you Penn State's acoustics jam band is better than everybody else's because everybody loves music in the, uh, in the acoustics program. So, so yeah, I think that that is one real way to, to draw people in to a point that to a point that Kita made, though, that, that I think is really nice, like trying to draw people in from fields like physics or fields like applied math that can come in and maybe they don't know acoustics, you described the slog that they might have to go through if they can't self-study. I think that is the role of these kind of like on-the-job training programs that, that need to exist. And one of the real challenges that I see though in that is the there's an enormous amount of inertia in getting one of those programs stood up. So, so I look at the UNH mass program the number of people that have to prepare multi-hour presentations to establish a one-week program is a really high bar to jump over for that first program. And then making sure that that you can get enough students advertised widely enough that you can get enough people in to make it go. I, I, I think these are the kinds of things that getting them started are very difficult and, and it's a difficult, it's a difficult path to us fill this kind of educational gap that we have. But once they're established, th then I think the way they go around is by word of mouth very frequently, right? We we see through that program, um, certain industries are gonna send three or four new hires every single year to this program. And they're using it literally as their background training program for for their employees. There's, there's certain companies that I, I know every year when I go there, I'm gonna see this list of people I do think, though, in 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 hearing those students talk, there's a demand for for an even wider an even wider set of training opportunities. But the the inertia to get that new course stood up is is quite high. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I see the same thing with the CBAS course. It's for grad students, and it's marine bioacoustics as opposed to underwater acoustics. Um, I should say it's bioacoustics, not just physical acoustics underwater. Um, so I, I, I hear you on that. And I would agree that the marine bioacoustics course, again, word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, I'm certain, Jen, that if you ask those students, hey, would you like to have one week on this narrower topic? Almost invariably, you would hear yes. But the the inertia to do a week on that topic, like the the startup cost in terms of people's time to get that built, because we're all doing this on nights and weekends, building those decks. That that's a very high that's a very high cost and an impediment to kind of growing the list of things that can be offered in this way. Uh, Liesl took her hand down. Oh, no, I still have the same question. I just was in anticipation, so I didn't leave it up. <laughs> oh, okay. Did you have a question, Liesl? I do. Yes, and and this is slightly off um, off script. 
But given that we have thousands of men and women separating and retiring from the Navy every year with a lot of this uh, knowledge, what could we do to build better bridges, on-ramps, crosswalks, however you want to frame it, to get them into the workforce to fill this trough in the U-shaped curve that's been described? I think they are doing some things, but um, I, I do think, it, at least for the Navy side, uh, um, I have a friend, he actually works for a Naval uh, Research Laboratory. He does some cross-site stuff with our unit. And he actually came into um, the oceanography side um, from or, or originally biomedical engineering, and then he got a, a, a master's, degree, I mean, a, a PhD in, a, in mechanical engineering, mostly geophysical and geofluids and that sort of thing. Um, I, I think there just needs to be a lot more um, marketing and awareness, which connects to a lot of these uh, university programs to let them know um, the opportunities and what is going on. I really don't think people know by and large, um, and I don't know how to get it out there, all the things that are happening inside some of our doors, um, some of the research projects and uh, some of the presentations that I've seen just walking around the halls of uh, NAVO and also um, uh, uh, FinMock over in Monterey. A uh, lot of really cool things. Um, and and I, I'm not sure what the answer is. I've been actually talking with someone at NAVO about how do we get that word out a little bit better. And they are doing something. Other panelists? Uh, the other, yeah, I was going to say the other two, two thoughts on that. One, I think Jim already touched on that some of us are, are opportunistically hiring some of those recent retirees into teaching you know, courses for us. One of the ways we've handled some of our staffing shortages, we hired uh, Dr. Holly Johnson for the last year as a part-time instructor to, who had just retired from the Sonar and Signals group. Um, <clears throat> and the other one I wanted to highlight is either just come out or will come out soon. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Stephen Garrett, who retired from both Penn, or worked at both Penn State and, uh, and Naval Postgraduate School, uh, has taken up a hobby, uh, substitute teaching high school shop and physics classes and, and brings a lot of his experience from acoustics and things into those classes. So I think, you know, it's, it's hard to, he said, he's the only real scientist many of them have ever met. Uh, he's having a blast. He talks about bringing in his notebook. So I would highly encourage the committee members uh, to go look at, at Steve's, uh, I think it's in acoustics today, either the most recent issue or the one coming up. I got a, an advanced copy. Steve had asked me for some some feedback on it. Um, but if it hasn't come out yet, it, it will soon. And I, I think that's something you might explore as another way we can help, uh, you know, as, as Keita says, help that push that discovery process earlier into the high school or, or even middle school thing. So I think that another strategy based on Liesl's comment that we could, could bank on. Yeah, I think Jim had his hand up next for answering and then Keita, and then we'll go back to um, the committee for another question. Great. I, I, Lisa's que uh, question is fantastic. Uh, we've been thinking about it, um, uh, how to ex exploit the folks that are retiring from the Navy, from both civilian and military. One of the things we've been thinking about here is uh, certificate programs, online certificate programs. You know, every gray-haired professor in this country now knows how to zo do Zoom, so we can do online instruction. Uh, so we're thinking of, uh, you know, and, and, and we're getting pressure from our administration to make money and stuff. So we're, we're, and I'm, my, I've been thinking in my head about what the next hire is going to be. I'm thinking of hiring a professor of practice or teaching faculty, uh, to help with, uh, and this, this teaching faculty could, could come from the Navy, you know, retire, recent retire. So, uh, that's, that's one approach that uh, I didn't get to in my presentation, but uh, that's that's on my list of things to talk to my dean about. So thank you for that idea. That was fantastic. And I captured it too. Thanks. Kita, we had her hand up next to answer this question. Yeah, I was just going to mention that I, I don't know if anyone is doing this in ocean acoustics specifically, but I have heard of success in programs where they basically have, um, they, they hire, kind of early career or mid-career um, individuals to fill, to, to begin filling the, the positions that perhaps are about to, the folks are 
aging, they're retiring out. And the idea though, is that you match the person who's going to be leaving with the person who's coming in. And that way for the next five, three to five to 10 years, they actually work together um, so that the person who's leaving doesn't take all of their institutional knowledge with them. And that the person coming in isn't coming in and having to start from scratch because the position has been vacant for one to two to five, however, however long. And so basically the idea is that um, whoever's maybe retiring soon, you get it on to the, the, the um, committee earlier, right? So instead of them saying, I'm going to be retiring next year, you don't want that to happen, right? You, you want to know that somebody's going to be leaving within five to 10 years so that you can have these types of programs in place so that you don't have that, as uh, Jim was saying, the kind of U-shaped trough, right? Where you have people that are leaving and there are people coming in, but they're, you know, undergraduates or they're maybe even high school. They're not going to be ready to fill that gap right away. So we, there's this idea is that you can actually look into as I mentioned before, adjacent fields, right? So look at people who have maybe a baseline skill set that can be trained to fill the position of somebody that's about to leave. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to Andrea. She's had her hand up patiently with a question. Yes, thanks, Jen, um, and thank you everyone for your insight. It's been amazing to kind of hear all your perspectives. I'm going to switch gears a little bit and kind of go back to um, something Ben was talking about in terms of, um, I guess I'm going to call it short form content, right? So like more specialized educational opportunities. And I'm curious, particularly from John, Jim, and Dan, how your institutions are either um, equipped or interested in pursuing those sorts of opportunities of developing this kind of shorter form content that may pull in students from different places, since we know that it's also a numbers issue here to get enough of a critical mass to run these types of programs. I'll jump in. I'll jump Can in I, first, if that's okay. Oh, oh. no, go ahead, Jim. Uh, I, I think that the, the week-long courses, the ones that Jen has done and the BAST and are just fantastic introductions. Um, I think there's, the next level would be perhaps certificates, uh, which could be three courses. I talked about those in a, a few minutes ago, online, um, arranged in a way that is convenient for people who are you know, working or have families. Uh, so this short, the, the, the short form uh, is, is really interesting. There's, there's uh, opportunity in acoustics, we're so small, that uh, you know, other bigger programs are doing it, but I, I think that's a great idea, and we're thinking about it. So thank you for that. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll echo what, what Jim said. I, I do, I do think, um, I do think a number of our institutions see this as a as a path that we can move forward with. I, I also think it's a knock on effect of of the um, pandemic is that all of us, as Jim has said, um, all of us learned how to use Zoom. Um, and so, so in terms of being able to open up, um, open up the opportunity for a larger number of people to participate in a course, I think it, it gives us a path where, where all of us can see something saying like, okay, there will be enough interest or there will be enough people. We're not having to travel all the way to Penn State. They're not having to travel all the way to Rhode Island. Um, in order to in order to consume this course, maybe we could offer it in a in a hybrid format. So I, I do think um, I do think there is I, I think respective institutions understand there's a demand signal for it. I, I think it's it's at some level it's what I what I spoke to Jen about a moment ago. It's it's getting the critical mass of the lecturers that are willing to build the content to then be able to offer it the first time because once. Once you offer it once, it's very easy to run the course again and again. It, it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling thing. Just a, you know, a couple of thoughts under responding to that um, it, it, that's maybe like different from Dan and Jim's perspective, which is, is one of my other uh, active hobbies is uh, engineering pedagogy. Uh, and, and all the best data in my own research and others I've read says those you know, traditional lecture classes 
are better than nothing, but only barely. And I've become a huge proponent of, of active learning um, and, and that. So I haven't participated in those courses because I think those sort of big slide deck things are, I mean, for really expert learners, they, people who are expert learners, they can pick up a lot if they can understand how to transfer it onto existing conceptual frameworks. But I think for the most part, um, they're dangerous. And I don't know that, that they make people think, understand what they think they understand more than they do. It's called the illusion of knowledge often in, in pedagogical literature. Uh, and, and I've been busily giving it away for 10 years on my YouTube channel. So rather than treating it as a cash cow and trying to sell it to my, my dean or my, my provost, um, and I think some of that is, is UMass Lowell has really always already established itself in the UMass system as the, the 500 pound gorilla in online learning. Um, but, you know, I, I found a bunch of the things I put online just to continue my flipped classrooms uh, during the pandemic in array processing have become huge. You know, it was never actually intentional. I was just putting up for my students and at you know, conferences, I now have people coming up and introducing themselves to me saying that particularly in array processing where there's graduate acoustics related classes, there's very little there. Uh, and to a lesser extent, my undergrad signals and, and signal processing classes. But I think, you know, maybe there's, there's more opportunity in conversations about, well, what if, what if some of these, you know, and, and I guess the other distinction I'd make before we went into that is, as you know, a Zoom recording of a lecture is not necessarily a quality online learning experience. There's a lot of things you need to think about what works in online education and what makes the best pedagogical outcomes isn't just a recording of you doing with what's in the room. The same way that you know a, a stage actor doesn't necessarily translate to movies or TV shows well. There's a different subset of skills and interactions that you have to build on. Um, so th th you know, I think those are all important things. But that said, I you know, I think there's opportunities that either some of these retiring personnel could be recording things um, or, you know, there could be funding opportunities for, for the, you know, the, the government to identify people to start putting, you know, if, if, if it's not going to be necessarily like, you know, Dan said, getting over that hurdle on your own time, but it's a grant you know, that someone gets funded for four weeks of their salary to create that slide deck and to put, and maybe as part of that, to put it up for free on a, a you know, a, a streaming service whether it's YouTube or whatever comes next. Um, I think those are all important parts of this conversation. Uh, Kita, you had an answer to this question too? Yeah, I was actually going to kind of echo John's statements here, which is it's really great to improve and increase access by having online virtual content, but this also is really, um, to Dan's other point, this is always a heavy lift. Um, I can speak to ASAs, uh, most recent effort, which is we've created um, an undergraduate research program, which is a lot of work, right? Like it's a lot of time. It's a lot of funding that we have to secure. We have a short course component of that and it's all well and good. But John's last point of we, I would really argue that we cannot keep asking people to do this on a voluntary um, basis. You cannot ask faculty, you cannot ask, really, I would argue, retired folks to do this for free because it is a full-time job to make a quality educational product, even if it is reusable, because that kind of actually takes even more labor to make sure something is a bit more evergreen. So I would caution people from just saying, I'm going to create some slides that will work for, you know, the next five to 10 to 15 years, because I, as somebody who is really interested in quality education and the theory of learning, as John mentioned, generally that doesn't work. Uh, and so if you're going to come up with short courses, tutorials, webinars, whether it's in person or virtual, I would argue that one of the gaps in this is that we are asking people to do it voluntarily and that we're asking non-experts in education to come up with education content when they themselves are not trained to be really good educators in these modes. Lots of people can say, I've sat through a lecture that was awful and I didn't learn anything, whether it was in the classroom or virtually. And a lot of people can say, I th sat through the best lecture I've ever sat through and I learned so much. And usually the difference in that is somebody who comes in with an with 
the educator in mind, right? They they want to educate, they want to train, they un, they're aware of their learners' needs and wants and desires, as opposed to one of my um, common quotes is, oftentimes professors like to profess. We need teachers who know how to teach. Professing is great in a lot of ways, but professing doesn't help learners learn. Thanks, Kita. Um, Gail, you've been patiently waiting with a question. Go ahead. Yes, thank you everyone for your um, spending time with us today. This has been really great. Um, I'm, I'm, we have come to an understanding that recruitment in ocean acoustics and in, acoust and in acoustics in general is an issue, while at the same time, workforce needs are growing, um, specifically in the US, and but also worldwide. So looking at this from the other side of the coin, do you think that if we could get students interested in careers in this discipline earlier on so that um, they were applying for an education, do we have the capacity in our country to handle um, an influx of students who want a degree in ocean acoustics? Does your, and, and I'll say, just even looking at your own institutions, do you have the capacity to handle, um, you know, a wave, if you will, uh, of, of students? I mean, I, th I think we certainly do on the sort of next 10 years. I said, I'm not sure beyond that. We certainly have uh, capacity and, and in public institutions of higher ed, I'm sure Jim and Dan can speak to this too. You know, demand creates capacity. That, you know, if, if we have people coming in, you know, the, the best way to get a line, a faculty line to hire a new faculty or build on that is for them, to, 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 for a program to be bursting at the seams. You know, that our, our, you know, our nursing program is similar in that their biggest challenge is finding the professors. They can, they always have more qualified nursing students than they can fit in the classroom. So every time they get a chance to hire someone good, they're very, have a very strong argument to go to the dean and the provost. So I think the wave, I would be surprised if the wave can build faster than we can grow capacity. I think we have plenty, we have excess capacity now and many other <clears throat> programs do. I agree with John. I, I, I think if, if students were coming in and, and there was a sizable number asking for course in X, we would we would teach the course, right? We would we would the course would get developed. Um and if it was large enough that uh, that the current faculty, like if the demand was large enough, the current faculty can't handle the the workload, the faculty would grow. Um, I, I can't remember if it was Jim or John, but one of you said, you know, these courses are taught every two to three years on a rotating basis. If the demand grew, it would be these courses are taught every year, or these courses are taught every you know every one to two, right? And you would just you would run the courses more often, and you would bring a you would bring faculty on them. To, to cover them. Yeah. I, I will say that our administration uh, uh, appreciates acoustics and appreciates uh, the needs uh, of the local economy, the defense industry, mainly defense. Um, uh, so we're very lucky here at the University of Rhode Island that we have uh, both in the Graduate School of Oceanography and the College of Engineering, deans who 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 understand that, and our president. Um, so we've been we've been lucky, and I think if if the demand if we do get an uptick, and our, our actually our freshman class just doubled, our incoming freshman class is doubled last year. So I don't know if that's the wave that's coming. I'm scared of it, um, and we're going to do our best to handle it. Um, so so. We, 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 if, if, like John, if, if, if there is demand, we will meet it <clears throat> and we'll figure out a way. So uh, that's a great problem to have. I'd much rather have that than, you know, the, the other, the other side where everything's dwindling down and you're closing. Uh, that's awful. I'd rather, let's burst, let's, let's grow and big and everything. And we'll, we'll, we'll find a way to put 300 students in a, in a, in a in a auditorium, and you know, I I don't think that's the best way to learn either. But uh, thank you. Okay, um, 
David, you had your hand up for this question. Um, I, I was going to say, I think there's definitely demand, and I mean, there's DOD, but if you look on the commercial side, uh, you know, ocean exploration, and, you know, uh, to say it, you know, I, I remember someone had told me probably 15 years ago, and this was on the military side, he said climate change is also changing the landscape, um, especially in the Arctic. So I, I underwent a lot of training in the Ar in, in Arctic meteorology and and understanding that environment because there was an understanding that, that was going to become a landscape that was going to be open for business, for lack of better terms. And I think that creates demand as well. Um, one thing that was just a question that I just kind of jotted down as everybody was talking about training, something that we're doing, I, I work in, in utilities, uh, water resources as a civilian. And one thing that we talk about a lot is um, essentially the digital twin and virtual environments that you can go in and do things have something go wrong and, and you're actually in the interface. And it's just more maybe a, a question, uh, is there any opportunities for some sort of virtual ocean environment that you can stick a student in, have them do things, have them put a piece of equipment in, have things go wrong um, and, and learn from it. And I, I just don't know if that exists. I'm, I'm just curious. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm rigorously taking notes here as, as people are speaking. Um, next question looks like Carolyn Rupel. Uh, that was a really interesting idea you just posed, David. Um, so obviously I work for a civilian agency, but a lot, I, and I'm sorry for the committee because I'm sure I sound like a broken record on this, but um, a lot of jobs in the US in ocean acoustics are either at civilian agencies that can only hire U.S. citizens or somehow related to the military or you need clearance because you're a professor working on research for the military or, or whatever. So my question is actually, are um, obviously David is only dealing with U.S. citizens, but the rest of you, um, what is the, the sort of composition of your graduate programs? And, and are you seeing that there's a problem getting U.S. citizens um, in these programs who are then going to go out and be able to take a lot of these jobs that are available. Thank you. Uh, I, I can speak to that. Our, our campus, our, our, our graduate program lately, for even pre-COVID, is more than half U.S. citizens. We have uh, an accelerated BSMS pathway that retains a lot of our top students for those degrees. Um, and, and, you know, even my own group, I think that my PhD uh, graduates are roughly half U.S. citizens. Um, so I, I think that's actually less of an issue than it was 15 or 20 years ago when I started as a professor. Um, and I think that's another part where where the social mobility is important, that, that you know, we're tapping into a pool of people that historically weren't getting STEM degrees. Um, and, and many of them are very uh, excited about the opportunities in these fields that, that are predominantly U.S. citizens. Uh, just a, you know, another quick anecdote. I had a an undergraduate that I mentored did some research internships with me, who got a job at one of the Navy research labs, um, one of the DoD labs, um, and they told her what her salary was, and she didn't know what that meant. She asked them what the hourly rate was. Like no one in her extended family had ever had a salaried job, and they were like, "Well, we can like we can get a calculator and tell you what the hourly pay is." But, you know, so those are the, the people who I think, you know, the U.S. citizens that we are, when things succeed, are opening up horizons for and opportunities for. Um, and, and at least for us, and, and I think there are other schools focused on, on the social mobility and, and, and these underserved populations. Uh, you know, I think we have a lot of great success stories in addressing that. What was a big challenge, I think, in my experience, 10 to 15 years ago. The, the flip side is, is uh, you're no longer guaranteed to get the US citizens coming out. That the, the detriment of the DOD labs has been that every smart assistant without naming brand names has a raise in it now. And so it used to be that my students who are US citizens in a raise were going to DOD contractors or DOD labs. Uh, now those labs are having to outbid Amazon and Apple for people with array expertise. Uh, and that has been a different challenge than we've been used to. Dan and then Jim. Oh, okay. oh, sorry, Dan. 
Yeah, so so I I think in in looking at the program at at Penn State, the the applicants are are um, more than half, slightly more than half U.S. citizens. So I think there there's a there's a decent decent number there to draw from. The the number though that are applying that say, hey, I want to work in ocean acoustics, that number is incredibly small, right? So it, it becomes a recruitment it becomes a recruitment problem. Or a recruitment um, effort on the part of uh, on the part of the professors in the program of meeting with students, kind of educating them about what why they might be interested in your problem. But to echo um, to echo a, a point that that John made, and that I I know one of his fellow faculty members, Dave Brown, will experience. In addition to losing um, all of all of the students you train to be experts on arrays. Um, very, very many of these organizations that are putting arrays in their smart speakers, those arrays consist of transducers, and we lose a number of our trans, a number of people in our transducer uh, that are educated as in transduction are then going on to work for Bose and and like commercial audio commercial audio institutes. So that's that's a place where we get people in a pipeline. Um, they are educated in in a core area that that supports underwater acoustics. But but from a from an employment perspective, um, that they're being captured by other industries. Jim. Yeah, uh, uh, re echoing uh, significantly more than half uh, of our graduate students are U.S. citizens, and in ocean acoustics, it's even higher because a lot of the funding right now that is uh, from DoD is U.S. citizen only. So a lot of those are are working if that was their purpose. So uh, and in our undergraduate program, it's ninety five percent, ninety nine percent U.S. citizen. So thank you, David. Your hand still up. Was that from before, or did you want to answer this question too? Oh. From before, let me take it down. Okay. Just, just, just to follow up on one other thing about that, one of our real success stories, and maybe something this panel can highlight or maybe even find ways to grow is that the DOD SMART uh, program, which is these scholarships that are, you know, sort of a, a simple tagline is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like grad school ROTC for civilian defense employees, that these people have their grad school paid by the federal government. And then they, for an equal number of years, they work as a civilian employee at a DOD sponsoring facility. And they're guaranteed to have those jobs when they graduate. Uh, it started out as sort of a, a well-kept secret, and that's not true anymore. And one of the, the downsides of that is I, when I go talk to colleagues and collaborators at, at Newick and other DOD labs, they have more need than they can get bills, that they're sort of budget billets rather. They're budget limited in like they say, well, Newick only gets to hire three people this year, so sonar signal processing might get one. And there might be five codes that have really excellent U.S. citizen candidates they want to hire. So if there are ways that either, you know, some of the smart billets can be designated for these critical needs, or there's a, a similar program that is specifically coming through the DOD for the Navy or, or in these target areas for prioritizing them. I think there's actually, that's a place where we're capacity limited, that there are more highly qualified U.S. citizens who want to work in ocean acoustics in these supporting fields than there are uh, spots available in the hiring, uh, hiring DOD labs. This also, oh. oh, sorry. Good. No, I, just to uh, to extend on on what John said, the smart program is great. The the other one that um, that I've had some experience with students working through is the Indie Seg Fellowship as well. That that's a that's a fantastic fellowship. It, it brings students in that are working on a defense related application. They're doing their PhD um, th through that program. They're getting really well integrated and in studying uh, studying generally an important problem, um, and then and then um, it, it does set them up to be a very attractive candidates for our for our laboratories and and different civilian agencies. Thank you, Kita. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that I, this maybe is more on the outreach side of things, but I know oftentimes a barrier to discovery fields like acoustics is that incoming students don't understand what jobs exist for that content area and so they're less likely to pursue it 
And so if they don't know what kind of jobs exist in ocean acoustics, they don't think there are jobs that exist in ocean acoustics. Now, I don't want students to be kind of job focused, right? Sometimes it is nice to go and learn and enjoy the enjoy that. But a lot of people from, you know, these uh, lower socioeconomic statuses, they are job focused, right? So they go for majors that are jobs, right? So they go for education because they know they can be a teacher. They go for psychologists because they know that they can they can be a psychologist, right? So they they tend to gravitate towards majors that have known jobs. And I think for this panel, those are going to be your students that are going into engineering um, because they know they can be an engineer, but they don't know what engineering acoustics is, right? So how do you get those students? Okay, thank you. Um... We are just about at time. I've taken over two pages of notes as everybody has been talking. So thank you very much. I love to hear um, different perspectives from different places. And I think that the entire committee um, feels that this has been a very worthwhile investment in time and information gathering. Um, we have three minutes left. Is there anybody who would like to just take a, either on the committee or on the guest panel, take a 30 second, Final comment? That's okay. One of the things that I have noticed um, after the panel has ended, after both panels, I ended up getting two or three emails from different people who were on the panel saying, oh, I forgot to say this, or I really wanted to make this point clear that you should consider in the report. So if something comes to mind after we've said goodbye, uh, please don't hesitate to drop me or Caroline or anyone on the committee a note. We'll share it with the rest of the committee for it to be um, considered as an information gathering um, communication. And I would like to say on behalf of myself, the National Academies and the entire committee, thank you for spending this time with us and um, sharing your thoughts on something that we hope is going to culminate in a very impactful report where we see ocean acoustics grow over the next 10 years. So thank you very much. Caroline, would you like to say any parting words? Um, yes, thank you, Jen. Um, and thank you again to the panelists. Um, really appreciate the, the discussion today and the preparation for um, answering our committee's questions. It was very informative um, and I really appreciate uh, everyone's time. Um, and please feel free to reach out if you have any comments, questions after the um, panel has closed. And also um, for our committee members, if there's anything that you think of afterwards, um, please let me know and I can send questions the other way too, if the panelists um, don't mind answering additional questions if things come up from our committee. And don't forget to fill out the survey. <laughs> That's my biggest plug right now to fill out the survey and pass it along to anybody you think could contribute valuable information. All right. Well, again, thank you very much for your time. And um, I'll see you guys either at the next ASA or Dan, you'll be here for the short course next week. Have a wonderful afternoon, everybody. And this concludes our information gathering session today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.